Welcome to the Music Is My Life podcast from Berkeley Online. I'm your host, Pat Healy, and take note of Butch Vig. You know him as the drummer and producer of the band Garbage, or as the producer of such mammoth 1990s recordings as Nirvana's Nevermind, or the first few Smashing Pumpkins releases. His production career began long before that, though. In Wendy Schneider's 2016 documentary, The Smart Studios Story, we learn that as a teenager, Butch would painstakingly resequence his favorite albums, trying to come up with a perfect track list. He began Smart Studios in his 20s with his friend Steve Marker, and one of the bands they recorded was their own, Spooner, with guitarist and lead singer Duke Erickson. Incidentally, Steve and Duke are also Butch's current bandmates in Garbage, along with singer Shirley Manson. They've just released their seventh studio album, No Gods, No Masters, last Friday. So check it out. But now let's go way back to the beginning of Butch's musical life, which began in Wisconsin with his mom. Tell us all about it, Butch. Well, my mom was a music teacher, so I was exposed to all different kinds of music growing up from a very early age. And and she got me playing piano when I was six. Probably the first things I heard, though, that I remember were musicals, like On a Clear Day You Can See Forever and West Side Story. Every night at dinner, she would put on a musical and then play side one, then flip it over during dinner, and we'd play side two. But she also exposed me to like pop music. Like She bought Beatles records and the Tijuana Brass and Nat King Cole and Frank Sinatra. And then my local, my town, Viroqua, was a really small Norwegian farming community in Wisconsin. And so the radio there was country music in the morning and then polkas from after the after the news from like noon till one they played polkas from one till four and they had mail train on from four to five and that was top 40 radio they would play the hits so i was you know listening to all that music all the time because we had the radio on the car my, my parents played the radio at home if my mom wasn't playing a record and uh so I'm, I'm very lucky in a way that i heard and was exposed to so many different styles of music because I think it was very informative uh, for me in becoming a music producer. Yeah. And, and when you did first start playing your first instrument uh, after the piano was the drums, right? Yeah. I saw, I think in like sixth grade uh, or fifth grade, I saw the who play in the Smothers Brothers show. And I saw Keith Moon smash up his drum kit at the end of my generation. I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and, uh, my mom said, we'll get you a drum kit if you continue with your piano lessons. And I said, of course I will. And then I lied because I, over the course of the year, I, I took drum lessons. She made me take drum lessons too with a, with a, a percussionist to learn how to do random cues and paradiddles and how to correctly hold your sticks and whatever. Um, but I let the piano slide, which I regret because I'm a pretty hack piano player now and I wish my chops were better. But once I got into started playing drums, there was no going back, I was full on rock and roll at that point. And so then you play in and out of bands in high school, I'm guessing. And and the, the first recorded instance I know of you is, is Spooner. But what were some of the bands before that like? Oh man, well, Pat, you can't be in too many bands. Even today I have side bands with Garbage with some of my friends in Madison, uh, the Nodal Boyfriends and I have a, a, a band, uh, Five Billion in Diamonds with two of my DJ friends who live in the UK. Uh, my first band, my first, first band was, uh, I think we were called Rat Pellets. And uh, it was me and my neighbor, Bruce Keen, and my cousin, Dom, Dom Brewster. And, uh, uh, you know, we barely could play. They could barely play their instruments. And that was probably when I was about 12 or 13. And when I was 16, we I formed a band with some uh, uh, local players in Viroqua called Eclipse. We thought we were the best thing ever. We played mostly covers like by uh, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, The Rolling Stones, you know, uh, whatever. But we wrote one original song. Our, our singer, his name was Worm Man. That was his nickname because he would he would eat things for money. He goes, I'll eat this worm for 50 cents. We go, okay, here's 50 cents. And he'd eat a worm, whatever. He was just a strange guy. But he would sing, you know, with, without it. He'd take his shirt off and he was brawny chested. Like he'd sort of strut around the stage. It was really funny. Looking back at it now, looking at photos I have of the of the band, we wrote one original song. We wanted to record a seven-inch single, 
And my mom called Lindy Shannon, who was the music critic in La Crosse, which was like the big city, like 60,000 people about 30 miles away. He completely shot us down. He said, they're not ready. They need a manager. They need a publisher. They need a producer, all this stuff. They need a label. And I remember I got frustrated and uh, I call up a friend of mine who had a, a reel-to-reel recorder, a proper, like a, a TIAC or a decoder or, or a Sony. I don't remember what it was, but it was a reel-to-reel. And and I started engineering our rehearsals and we recorded, you know, using headphones. I'd set mics up on the drums, a couple of mics in around the room and the singer had a mic. And, and uh, I can't find those recordings now, but I wish I could because I bet they would be priceless sounding. <laughs> that's when I first started. I really, I really fell in love with, I was fascinated with rec- the recording process. And so yeah. because of that snub by the, the music critic, it, it sort of forced me into a DIY mentality and, uh, I feel like I still sort of have that mentality today. Yeah. Do you think that uh, helped inform your MO at Smart Studios where nobody needed a label, nobody needed any backing, they didn't need to be ready? Yeah, definitely. And I think part of, uh, for us, the timing was good because when we started Smart and when I started to learn as an engineer and producer, I didn't really know what I was doing, but the bands didn't either. And so we were just all sort of winging it together. And punk and new wave, I think, sort of made it feel like it was possible to to do anything. You didn't have to sound like the Beatles or the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin. You know, you just, you could go in and a record could sound god awful terrible, but you were still going to make it and you were going to press up a seven inch and put it out. And that felt really empowering. So when, when you started getting these bands a, a, into the studio and, and, you know, your own included, was it always understood, uh, especially in Spooner, that you were you were the main guy doing the engineering? Or, or was there any back and forth where, you know, Steve was saying, no, I, w- I want to do this. I want to be in control. Or how did that all work? Well, in terms of Spooner, I mean, I, I took it upon myself to sort of become the engineer producer of our recordings. Uh, the very first record we did. Uh, we worked with Gary Klieb from a band called Shoes, who we were good friends with. And they had done a record called Black Vinyl on a four track in their living room and got signed to Elektra. And then they put out a, a bunch of big budget rock records on Elektra. And uh, Gary produced the first record that we did. And he also really mentored me because he knew I was interested in recording and, and, and was very helpful. But when we started Smart, it was so lo-fi that for me, part of recording was problem solving. Like, this sounds like shit. How can I make it sound a little bit better? You know, like in, in Spooner, I, th- I don't think anybody else could be bothered with having to deal with that. <laughs> so it, was, it was, I sort of took it upon myself to try and figure out how to make the records sound as good as we could, you know, with, with whatever limited uh, facilities we had. And, uh, you know, I do, cause I'm still, Duke and Steve are, we're both in garbage with me, you know, we've been right. recording and making music for 30 plus years now. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, was that always the MO to have the band? Uh, I mean, or, or was that just at some point while doing Smart, you said, this is too much, why don't we just do it ourselves? Well, the reason we built Smart really was to have a sort of a clubhouse where Steve and I could record, and w- whether a Spooner or other projects. You know, we, we, we liked, both of us were nerds. We just like, I like being in a recording studio. I just like the vibe. I also like being in bands. There's that sort of little click you're in with your buddies and, you know, we still have that in garbage with Shirley and, and the three of us. And, uh, you know, we're very close and I, I like that. I like being in bands. So being, having, having the studio allowed me to bring my bands in and just fuck around basically, you know, mm-hmm. we could record, we'd spend all day recording. If we didn't like it, just erase it and start again tomorrow, you know, and uh, we never, there was never any sort of corporate pressure or a, uh, too much financial worry because the, the the overhead of the studio was pretty low. You know, we, we'd never really built up this giant complex that cost, you know, $50,000 a month to maintain or whatever. We, we always kept it a pretty low profile. So it made it possible for us to do that, just to spend a lot of time just experimenting. Yeah. How, I wondered about corporate pressure and, and some of the records that you did do became huge, but it was almost as if they weren't huge. The bands weren't huge before you worked with them. So it was that kind of a way to keep the corporate pressure off you or keep the suits out as it were? Well, yeah, the good thing about being in Madison was it was two flights. <laughs> you know, I took about eight hours door to door to fly from LA to, to Madison. And, uh, and so it wasn't that easy to get to. And we sort of felt like the business overlooked the Midwest a lot. The, the corporate cultures were in the East Coast and West Coast, New York and LA and Nashville to a certain extent. 
that's where all the press was, the major media, that's where all the major labels were. And um, so I think people go, oh, they're making a record in Madison, you know, and where's that? And a lot of people didn't even know where it was. And so we were left to our own devices, even even when we sort of grew out of doing the the indie bands to some that started getting signed to, to major labels that were coming to smart. We kind of were left free reign, which was great. There's that story about Kurt Cobain wanted to use you for never mind, but Geffen said no, but then finally you were able to make it happen. And, and was there at least more pressure on you to take those original demos and make them smoother or make them poppier? Well, yeah, it, it's interesting uh, how I, ended up doing Nevermind, the band wanted me to produce it. And Geffen had no idea who I was. I had never done a major label record. And uh, although I had just done Gish um, with the Pumpkins, but I don't think it had come out yet. They wanted to work with me. And uh, Chris called me up and said, well, Geffen said, maybe you could be the engineer, but we they, they still want us to work with a, a big name producer. So the band met with like a half dozen big name producers. I knew them all too. And I was like, I would love to work with any of those guys. I'm sure I will learn a lot. They were all, you know, like Scott Litt, who, who I know is, is an amazing producer. Uh, Ed Stasium, who worked with the Ramones and the Smithereens. I can't remember the list, but it was a really good list. And uh, the band met with a bunch of them, didn't like them all. And so literally a week before I went to record Nevermind, they called up and said, you're the producer, we want you. And Gavin has said yes. I was like, oh shit. Then, then I was like, because in my head, I, I was thinking, I'm just going to be engineering. It'll be easy. I'll just set up and then, you know, the producer will make all the decisions. And then I was, I jumped in the frying pan, you know, it was good. It, it, yeah. to the, for the most part, Geffen left me alone with the band in, um, in LA when we were recording too. So they only came in, I think they came in once in the middle of the record. And then like when we were mixing, obviously they came by the studio to hear the mixes and stuff, but um, so it was cool. Uh, Sean Slade is a professor at Berkeley College of Music and, and a friend. And he said, could you ask uh, ask him if he remembers Courtney Love's conversation with him during the studio setup of Live Through This when she asked him about using a Turbo 57 on the snare? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Um it was interesting because when I started, I was doing Siamese Dream in Atlanta, and that's where they, I think they did that record in Atlanta, also at Triclop Studios. And yeah, and Kurt kept calling me and saying, I, Kurt, Courtney has some questions. And I go, you know what, you know, I, I couldn't do the record. I, I had something committed after I was doing it, and, and she was going to work with Sean and, and, uh, and his partner, and, the, and, and, uh, but she, he, he, she kept asking, you know, what would, what would Butch do? And event, eventually I said, look, you can't keep calling me. I, you're in good hands. Just go make their record, you know, whatever. And uh, it was funny. Somebody was saying, you know, we're, we're doing so well after Nevermind and getting all these faxes from bands like The Cult. And, and if you could take time, like find time in between the minutes of the day, and like give yourself maybe like four months from that era would there be any bands that you would have worked with that you just didn't have time for i don't i guess i never i never really think in those terms um and part of it i was lucky to do a lot of remixes with artists who i had immense respect for like beck and nine inch nails and alanis who we toured with. we're going to tour with garbage we're going to tour with alanis later this year I ended up working with you too i did some remixes and then I, they flew me out to a bunch of their uh, zoo tv shows and it, I, I, i'm a youtube fan i love them and i octung baby is also in my top 10 records of all time it's just incredible and that was an amazing same here story. yeah and then for them to be hey butch hey butch you want to go get a guinness and a jameson i'm like fuck yeah bono whatever you're doing i'm doing it too you know we're <laughs> I, I the one thing that, that i i wish had happened when i was doing producing the the soundtrack for sound city the documentary that dave Grohl did on uh, on the studio but also i'm collaborating with music we set the studio up one day because Neil Young was going to come and jam with Dave and Chris. And I knew if he played with Chris Novoselic and Dave Grohl, he was going to be playing with Crazy Horse on steroids. And I know Neil would have went, hey, this sounds pretty good. Let's go on tour. <laughs> My engineer, we had everything set up. We had Neil's crew come down. They had his amp set up. Um, Dave and Chris were totally jazzed. We're, we're you know. We we're gonna they were gonna rock with Neil Young. I was gonna produce it. We we're gonna be in the studio all day. And then we got a call like at two in the afternoon. 
Neil had, was on a book tour and a, and a flight got ske- or scheduled or rescheduled. He had to do a TV show or something. So we lost the session for the day and then they tried to reschedule it. And then because of his, his schedule, we couldn't fit it in. It was kind of crushing because I just know it would have been a special, it would have been a special day in the studio. And uh, maybe it'll happen again at some point, but that would have been a good one. So tell me, you were working on Gish right up to that time where, where they were calling about Nevermind. Gish is such a unique record in the sense that I've never heard drums sound like that before or after. And and it sounds like it was a very purposeful thing, but I've never heard it recreated. Could you do, recreate those sounds right now if you had to? Probably not. And it's due to a bunch of circumstances. Uh, one, the the way the tracking room at the time was designed in at smart uh, the main live room was really live and uh it was kind of boxy but it was slightly irregular so it didn't really have any slappy reflections but oh my god the sound pressure as soon as you started playing drums in there was just crushing and you can hear that a lot of the records i can kill those are records and uh some of the other records i was doing but i really kind of exaggerated it um on some of the on some of the songs on gish but uh, a lot of that had to do with Jimmy Chamberlain too, you know, and I tried to record him very meticulously. I remember right before the record, I bought a bunch of API preamps, like lunchbox things, because I wanted to just have better inputs, uh, better preamps and, and EQs. And I, I had worked on a couple of APIs and thought that they just sounded great. I really liked the, the way the EQs sounded, but his, his playing on that record, he's just an incredible drummer. So powerful with his dynamics, but also understands how to play drums when you're recording how loud the cymbal should be to how loud you're hitting the snare that you know and uh he, he was just he sort of mixed himself in, in a way which a lot of drummers don't understand when you're in the studio so he, he made my job easier but they wrote great songs and um that i think that record we spent about 30 days recording and mixing and for me at the time that was a massive luxury because i was used to doing records in three days you know we would track everything in one day do all of extra guitar and vocal overdubs in day two and then mix everything on day three and i did hundreds of records like that all of a sudden i felt like we were making a steely dan album <laughs> when i made gish so then then uh with siamese dream obviously the the approach to the drums is a bit different yeah and uh it was a different room that was triclops in atlanta which is a lot bigger um more more spacious live but not uh, the, the the live diffused pretty smoothly and not, it wasn't real overwhelming so uh it was kind of perfect for some of the some of the songs because we i could make the drums sound pretty dry if i wanted to and, and pretty dead or i could ma- open them up and make them sound much more lively but that the start of that record was hard because uh jimmy was pretty messed up on on drugs and uh mm-hmm. he would do these benders like he wouldn't go to sleep for 48 hours and uh, we could tell when he came in the studio he'd show up like at noon and he was just jittery and wired and Billy and I would go, you're not playing drums today. You know, go, go back to your, go back to the condo and sleep all day and we'll see if you can do it tomorrow. And after we had a couple songs that uh, we, you know, we tried to track early on that didn't, um, didn't sound very good. And then Billy threatened to fire him and send him home and said, Butch will play drums. And I'm thinking to myself, I can't play these songs. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not Jimmy Chamberlain, but it, it did. It, it kind of shocked him back into reality. Like, you know, I'm going to lose this, you know, unless I, get my shit together which he did and he played fantastic on the record then you make the decision to do garbage with with basically everybody who was in your orbit except for shirley who you included i i love the story about inviting her to smart studios and she feels a little weird but the the, the vibe works when you did set out to do garbage did you have any idea okay this will be the long-term thing for me when i started garbage i thought we were going to make a record we do a little bit of promotion and I go back to producing full-time. I had no intention of starting a full-time band. And it wasn't until we finished the whole process of recording the first album, which probably took about nine or 10 months. Um, we didn't work straight through, but we worked big chunks in, in there. The record started to take off even before we were finished mixing. We got a call from our label and said, you got to finish the record now. A K-Rock is playing Vow. And I'm like, what? we want to capitalize on this momentum. And so we, we kind of rushed the last three or four mixes that we weren't finished with. And then we said, okay, we'll do like a six week promo tour. And that turned into 18 months. They can you know, we started playing some shows and it was a bit of a train wreck the first couple of weeks because we were trying to figure out how do we play 
with all the samples that we're using and, and a lot of the weird triggers and the drums and things. And uh, so just from a techni technical standpoint, it was a bit of a clusterfuck, but we, we started to figure it out. But very quickly, we started having fun. And uh, so after that first six week session and the record was getting played in the radio, we're like, this is kind of cool. Let's, let's keep going. And then they kept adding dates, kept adding dates and it stretched into a, uh, almost a year and a half. And, uh, and now it's stretched into 25 years. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> kind of crazy. But what I thought was so interesting and unexpected about garbage when it came out was the samples and how you, your, your use of them evolved. Initially it felt like, um, I don't know if this was the intent, but an homage to other musicians you know, all the lyrical references that, uh, or melodic references that Shirley was dropping. And then you're doing like the train and Bane beat. And, and it, actually regarding that, is that a sample, the train and Bane sample, or is it just yeah, it you is. playing that's, the beat? Yeah, no, that's, that's train and Bane from the clash. And uh, a funny story with that is when we finished the, that recording, uh, we knew cause it was ran, ran all the way through the song that we had to get clearance. And our manager suggested maybe we should redo it because it might be a costly sample. So I spent like two days at Smart trying to recreate that Clash sample. And, you know, I can I can play the beat, but it was getting it to sound the same. I'm listening to the way the snare, and there's hand claps behind the snare and this type of reverb. And I worked on it like straight for two days. And I did a bunch of mixes and listened to it and went, it just doesn't sound the same. And uh, it, it, it wasn't as vibey. And part of it was that we fell in love with the, with because we wrote the song on top of that Clash loop. So... To me, it just had to stay there. And as it turns out, we worked out a, a, a fairly, a, a pretty good deal with them, but they get a little piece of the publishing, but I was happy to, to share, to say, hey, The Clash, you know, we're sharing publishing with, uh, with them on the song. And uh, I'm a huge Clash fan. I would probably put London Calling in my top 10 albums of all time. So to, to, be, to feel that they were part of our record was really cool. Yeah, what was that one of the records you resequenced when you were a kid? Or no, that was probably <laughs> no. after that time, right? No, no, it was after that. Like I remember one of the records I resequenced a bunch of different times was uh, Alice Cooper's Killer, which is a great record, by the way. Every song on the record is cool. Not only did I resequence it, but the recorder that my parents bought me had a a, a sound on sound where you could disconnect the erase button. So you could record a song rewind it and record another song on top of it. So I was doing mashups on top. Wow. Of it. You couldn't undo it. And it was what it was, you know, yeah. but you could control it by the input. Like if you wanted one song louder, you could run the input lower and then record the second song sort of quietly. Or if you want it louder, bring it up more. And uh, it, it just freaked me out that you could do that. And then I, yeah. figured, I realized if you turn the tape over, you can run it backwards and I could record another thing on it. So I, I did all this crazy experimenting you know and, th and then i learned uh, when i got to uw i took four semesters of electronic music and i learned how to edit tape and i was the king of tape editing man i could put together the craziest thing uh, you can all do it now with a you know in, in pro tools or uh, logic or whatever it's so easy to do but back then it was uh kind of a specialized uh, art form i think but i i totally embraced it man what keeps the four of you coming back to each other in creating music together there's a lot of things that um, uh, are sort of aligned with the band that make it easy for us to hang out together. And I think one of the things that has kept us together for 25 years is we take the piss out of each other. We're, we, there's a lot of self-deprecation amongst the four of us. That keeps, you know, we never get too high and mighty. And I think that's a healthy thing, you know, to not, not let the, your ego get in the way of of who you are as a band or, or the music you're trying to make. And uh, I mean, we're very passionate about uh the music we make and we we dove into this new record no gods no masters man we just felt like we had to make a record that was reflecting how crazy the world was in 2020 you know in 2020 we could have made a party record or a, a, an escape a pop a, an escapist record but it just didn't feel like that's was right it didn't ring true to us we wanted to make something that was uh, resonating with the world that we saw for me and i think for the rest of the band garbage has always been a really open creative canvas where all of us can write songs bring in an idea um we, we're multi-instrumentalists i play drums live but in the studio i play bass and guitar and keyboards as do duke and steve and shirley plays guitar and, and, and keyboards and uh, we share a lot of similar sensibilities in terms of what we like musically and just culture similar politics um food 
you know, the kind of wine that we like to drink. So one quick aside, you mentioned you all drink the same wine. What is that wine? Well, um, I really got into uh, Sauvignon Blancs probably about 20 years ago. Uh, in particular, I fell in love with Duckhorn Sauvignon Blanc, which to me was a California one that tasted like a French, uh, a French white. And then we, you know, I mean, garbage, we've, we've been known to like our cocktails in many different forms, but uh, for some reason that became a, a big favorite amongst, uh, amongst the, the band. They, they would even do, sometimes they would do taste testings to see if I could still pick out a duck horn. They would bring in like eight Sauvignon Blancs blind, taste them all. I taste them all. I go, this one, number seven, that's duck horn. They go, how the fuck do you do that? Is this my, my palate just got very fine tuned to that particular, uh, that particular vintage, I guess. I wonder if it has anything to do with like uh, honing the other senses that you, you know, you hone your hearing and maybe it makes your taste better. I mean, I, I know my memory is good because my smell, my sense of smell is strong, you know? Yeah, it could be. And it's funny. I, I do have, uh, I don't know if it's ADD or whatever, but I sometimes I hear things in mixes and I almost see colors when I'm working on a song synesthesia right yeah it's like tonal things uh it's hard for me to describe it's not it's not like i see the wall as green or blue or whatever but i kind of i can sort of see it and uh um and i start to hear things like deep in the mix the tone tonal things or little percussive things or and and uh sometimes i i can sort of drive myself crazy i can get overly fixated on something especially if, I, if it's bothering me it doesn't seem it doesn't sit quite right I'll go, I don't think that's working. And everybody in the band will go, what? We don't even hear what you're talking about. And, uh, and even sometimes our engineer, Billy, he'll, he'll be like, what are you talking about? I'll have to start going through tracks, soloing up tracks to figure out what it is I'm hearing. Or sometimes it's a combination of things. You know, It could be a, a bass line with a keyboard or a guitar, and it's, there's a harmonic that's rubbing and causing dissonance that can sound like something else in the track. And uh, The garbage album covers seem like they lend themselves to synesthesia with, with the pink one. It, it feels like it sounds pink and the orange one sounds orange. Yeah, I, I think there's some truth to that. It's, uh, it, and a lot of times Shirley will sort of, you know, she, she'll say this, I, this record has to have some pink, you know, and, and then she'll explain why. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense to me. I think we all all kind of feel like that in the band. You know, I think all of us to a certain degree get, uh, you know, Duke and Steve, like me, can be studio nerds. They can just go do deep dives on uh, sonic aspects of recording some tweaky little thing that at the end of the day, no one is probably going to really hear in the mix. But I, right. <laughs> you know, and I'm going to I'm going to make sure it sounds right, you know, to, until we print the final mix. Butch Vig. Working hard to make sure it sounds right until the very moment where he has to print the final mix. And now that mix is totally final. And the new Garbage album, No Gods, No Masters, is out now. Garbage is touring with Alanis Morissette this summer. Consult your favorite ticketing site to see if they're coming to a venue near you. Thanks so much for listening and as a way of letting you know that I appreciate the fact that you not only listen to this podcast, but you listen all the way to the credits, I'm going to let you in on a secret. You can try a Berkeley online course for $100 off the usual price. All you have to do, visit musicismylifepod.com and you'll find all the info you need there. Please leave a review for the Music Is My Life podcast on iTunes when you get a chance. This episode was edited by Talia Smith, mastered by Jose David Vindis Mora, all visual assets coordinated by Mike DeBenedictus, social media by Brooke Larson, web assistance courtesy of Mark Thomas, Steve Zimmerman, and Joe McDonough. Thanks to our video team who posts these episodes on YouTube two weeks after they premiere on podcast platforms. I wrote and recorded the Music Is My Life theme song, but the expert remixing comes courtesy of Lily Dickinson. Special thanks to Gabriel Reifer Cohen, Krista Williams, Bo Violet Vig, and again, thank you for listening. Take note to join us on Monday, June 28th for our season finale with Don Letts talking extensively about his brand new book, There and Black Again. Stay inspired, listeners. Talk to you soon.